Good afternoon. My name is Kim Stanger. Welcome to our webinar today talking about marketing traps for healthcare providers. I'm the guy that the marketing people hate because I'm the one who has to come in there and tell them that their beautiful creative marketing plan may violate federal or state laws. So these are the things that we're going to talk about today. We're going to give you an overview of some of the fraud and abuse laws that apply. Those are the ones that are probably the most problematic because those are the ones that can land you in jail. Things like Stark, the anti-kickback statute, civil monetary penalties law, some state laws. Now, some of these issues, a lot of these issues we touched on in our last webinar, but uh, I'm going to go over them quickly because they also have marketing ramifications. We'll then talk about HIPAA, some telemarketing concerns, false and deceptive marketing, uh, and marketing limits for certain providers. As far as the written materials, I apologize I didn't get those done until late last night, so hopefully you've all received those today. If for some reason you haven't received them, just shoot us an email and we'll make sure that you got those. Uh, the written materials are available per the webinar instructions, or you can contact me at the website that's listed there. Uh, the program will be recorded and available for download at our Health Law blog. If you have questions during the program, go ahead and shoot me an email, or you can use the chat function, and I'll follow up with you after the program. This is an overview of some of the relevant laws uh, dealing with marketing. There's a lot of stuff out there, but I wanted to kind of identify those that are most relevant to providers. Uh, there's additional laws that may apply to other types of entities, including pharmaceutical manufacturers or DME, POSs, um, those types of entities. I'm really not going to get into that stuff so much. I'm focusing on the laws that apply to most providers. Again, this is an overview. Additional state or federal laws may apply depending on the particular situation. In addition, the application of the laws and the principles we're going to talk about today may depend upon some specific facts, including whether or not you're dealing with government or private payers or the type of provider that you may be. Finally, to make my risk manager happy, this presentation is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice, and it does not create an attorney-client relationship. So with that said, let's launch into it and talk about some of those fraud and abuse laws. For you who are not initiated into the wonderful world of fraud and abuse laws, but you are a marketing person, remember this, that marketing techniques that are acceptable and desirable in other industries may actually be illegal in the healthcare industry. We in the healthcare industry are highly regulated, and some of the things that you may otherwise be able to do elsewhere, you can't do in the healthcare industry because of those federal fraud and abuse laws like the anti-kickback statute, Stark, and the CMP. Now, those federal fraud and abuse laws generally only apply to government programs or if government programs are involved, like Medicare or Medicaid. It may apply if the patient's a government program beneficiary or you're otherwise going to submit claims for items or services payable by government programs. If you don't deal with government programs, then you generally don't have to worry too much about the federal fraud and abuse laws. However, you may still have to deal with the state laws. Most states, I think all states, have their own versions of the federal fraud and abuse laws. They could be anti-kickback statutes, maybe many Stark or self-referral laws, other laws governing things like fee splitting, patient brokering, anti-rebates, any number of other laws that are called different things but have the same effect, which is generally limits on your ability to pay for referrals. Now, those state laws may be broader than the federal laws. They may apply to government programs like Medicaid, or they may actually be broader so that they apply to any kind of private payers or insurance plans. So you got to check your own state law when it comes time to apply this. But we're going to be talking primarily today about the federal laws because you guys on the phone are from lots of different states. So let's start out talking about the Ethics and Patient Referrals Act or STARC. This is going to apply to the extent that you're marketing physicians who are referral sources for certain designated health services that are payable by Medicare. That statute says that if a physician or their family member has a financial relationship with an entity, 
So maybe you've gone out and you have decided that you're going to market these physicians who are referral sources. So you're going to send them a nice basket of goodies or you're going to provide them free or discounted services or other things like that in order to get them to refer services to you. By doing that, you have created a financial relationship with that entity, with that physician. And so the rule says, if you've got that financial relationship, the physician may not refer patients to you for designated health services, and you may not bill Medicare for such designated health services unless you structure the arrangement to fit within a regulatory safe harbor. So if your desire was to go out and generate referrals from these other physicians, and that's why you gave that gift, it may backfire because if you have given that gift and you've created this financial relationship and can't fit within a safe harbor, then that physician can't make referrals to you. So you've actually precluded the referrals. So you got to make sure that your deals are structured to fit within the regulatory safe harbors. What happens if you don't? Well, you can't get paid for services that were provided per an improper referral. If you were paid for those services, then you've got to make a repayment within 60 days. And if you fail to do that, you can get hit up with civil penalties of $15,000 per claim submitted or $100,000 per scheme. A violation of the Stark Law could also uh, constitute an anti-kickback statute violation. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It may also trigger a False Claims Act, which could subject you to a whole bunch of other penalties. What are some possible safe harbors that apply to marketing? Well, these are just a few potential, but things like if you're contracting with the physician, you've got to make sure that those contracts are structured to fit within one of the relevant safe harbors. If you're just giving those physicians freebies or discounted stuff, there's not a whole lot of safe harbors that are going to apply. There is one that applies to incidental medical staff benefits, another one for non-monetary compensation, it's up to $300. But you got to make sure that each of those deals fit within the specific requirements for that specific safe harbor. If you don't fit within all the technical requirements, you're not going to get the benefit of the safe harbor, and you're going to violate Stark if there are improper referrals. That is a quick overview of Stark. Its evil cousin is the anti-kickback statute. The anti-kickback statute is actually much, much broader than Stark. Stark only applies to physicians and only to those physician referrals for certain types of designated health services. In contrast, the anti-kickback statute applies to anyone and referrals for items or services that are payable by government health care programs. Extremely broad. So it's going to apply if you're out there marketing government program beneficiaries or marketing business that's going to be paid by government health care programs like Medicare or Medicaid. The anti-kickback statute says you cannot knowingly and willfully offer, pay, solicit, or receive remuneration to induce referrals for items or services covered by a government health care program unless you structure that transaction to fit within a regulatory safe harbor. Note that the anti-kickback statute is extremely broad. It applies to anybody. It also applies to any form of remuneration, which is anything of value. It could be freebies, it could be discounted items or services, it could be um, contracts, even though you don't really need the contracts. Anything of value potentially implicates the anti-kickback statute. Based on recent, or not so recent now, 1985, uh, based on the Grieber case, the anti-kickback statute applies if one purpose of the remuneration is to induce referrals, even if there are other legitimate purposes. That's a hard statute or a hard standard to avoid. What happens if you violate the anti-kickback statute? Hey, this is a criminal statute. You can go to jail up to five years in prison and a $25,000 criminal fine. It's also a violation of the civil monetary penalties law, which means you can get hit up with $50,000 in administrative penalties. You can also get hit up with treble damages, and you can be excluded from Medicare or Medicaid. In addition, in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, the anti-kickback statute, a violation of the anti-kickback statute is also an automatic violation of the False Claims Act, which means that you can get hit up with additional penalties, and you can be subject to a lower burden of proof. If you violated the anti-kickback statute, you realize it, so you want to go do a mea culpa with the OIG and say, hey, sorry, we messed up. The OIG, you enter into that self-disclosure protocol, the OIG said that the minimum 
settlement that they will accept for an anti-kickback violation is $50,000. So you don't want to go anywhere near violating the anti-kickback statute. Well, there are some safe harbors. As long as you structure the deal to fit within these safe harbors, you are going to be safe. You don't have to fit within the safe harbors because ultimately it's a question of intent, whether one intent, one purpose of your uh, arrangement was to generate improper referrals. But if you fit within the safe harbors, you're going to be safe. Some possible safe harbors are if you're contracting with the referral source, you want to make sure that you fit within the employment or independent contractor arrangement. Basically, you have to pay fair market value and you can't compensate based on the volume of value referrals. There are certain other limited exceptions, but quite frankly, very few of those apply to your common marketing situations. Now, the government has published a lot of advisory opinions dealing with marketing situations in the healthcare industry. The OIG uh, publishes those. Those advisory opinions are not binding on anybody else other than the participants to that advisory opinion. So if you want to do a deal and you want to find out whether or not the government would come after you, you can request this advisory opinion in advance. If you don't want to go to the government in advance, you can still call up and look at those advisory opinions. They're not binding. They're not going to be a, a protection for you per se, but it'll let you see what the, how the government has addressed similar situations. Those are all published at the website that I've given you up there on the screen. That's the anti-kickback statute. There's a separate law called the Civil Monetary Penalties Law, like the uh, anti-kickback statute. It applies if you're marketing government programs or government program beneficiaries. It prohibits certain specified conduct, and there's a long list. For purposes of today, the stuff dealing with marketing, generally it prohibits kickbacks, the same type of stuff as the anti-kickback statute, but it also prohibits offering inducements to program beneficiaries if you know or should know that the remuneration is likely to influence the beneficiary to order or receive items or services payable by federal or state programs from a particular provider. So if you want to go out and offer freebies to patients who are Medicare beneficiaries, you've got to be concerned about the civil monetary penalties law. What are some of those freebies you may be offering to patients? Well, I've seen a whole gamut of things. It could be free items to induce purchases of other items or services, like, uh, hey, we'll give you free diapers or other supplies or gift cards if you come to us. It could be free services to induce referrals for other items, like, hey, come to us and we will provide free lawn care for you, like maybe some home health agencies or others might do. Um, it could be offering discounted items to induce the purchase of other items. It could be rebates, thank you gifts, insurance only billing, free transportation, your, uh, your imagination is really the limit on this type of stuff. If you are offering these free items or services, they may constitute kickbacks in exchange for receiving or referring services, or they may constitute inducements for patient services. If you are doing that in order to induce those referrals, if you're offering these freebies or discounted services to induce referrals, you got to be concerned about the civil monetary penalties law as well as the anti-kickback statute. Well, let's talk about the application of that. If you are dealing with government program beneficiaries, general rules, you can't offer that. However, you may be able to offer an item or service if it is of low value. This, the OIG has said, hey, we won't go after you if you're offering benefits to program beneficiaries for items or services that are less than $10 each or the aggregate is less than $50 per patient per year. In addition, there are exceptions if you are offering incentives to promote certain types of preventative care or remuneration that promotes access to care and poses a low risk of harm to patients in government programs, or retailers can offer coupons, rebates, or rewards so long as they're offered to the public as a whole and not based on any particular health condition. All of those are accepted from the definition of remuneration under the Civil Monetary Penalties Law. Well, what about if you're not dealing with government programs or government program beneficiaries? What about if it's purely a private pay situation? Well, then you may not have to worry about the federal programs, but you better check your state laws and make sure that there's no state law prohibition against this type of stuff. Also, you've got to be aware of simply carving out federal programs. 
for example, saying, hey, we're going to offer these freebies to patients, but not to government program beneficiaries. We'll only offer it to private pay patients. Um, or to program beneficiaries, um, you know, you may be Medicare, but we're not going to offer these services to you for Medicare benefits, only for non-covered services. The problem with offering those kind of carve-out situations to program beneficiaries is it may also induce them to come to you for your program, for your federal program business, and therefore the government says, hey, if that's the situation, then really offering that is to solicit their federal program business, and therefore you don't get a free pass, and we may be able to come after you if one of the purposes is to induce referrals for items or services covered by federal program business. So be careful about those carve-out situations. All right, what about insurance-only billing? You've seen that on billboards or on the radio. Hey, come to us and we will waive your co-pays and deductibles. We will only bill your insurance. Government programs and private payers do not like that. Generally, you cannot waive co-pays or deductibles unless you have, a, you have made a good faith determination of financial need or have made unsuccessful collection efforts. It is not part of an any advertisement or solicitation, and it's non-routine. If you do that, then the government says, hey, we won't come back to you against you, at least under the civil monetary penalties law. Well, what about private insurance? You're only, only going to waiver those co-pays or discount or co-pays or deductibles from uh, private insurance uh, patients. Well, your, your insurance companies do not like that either because they factored those co-pays in when they were setting their rates and determining their utilization. And so that is usually going to violate your managed care contract, so you better be careful about waiving co-pays or deductibles if you are involved with any government or private payer. Ultimately, for private pay insurance, you ought to check your state laws. What about prompt pay discounts? Well, the OIG, if you're dealing with government program beneficiaries or programs, the OIG has approved prompt pay discounts for government beneficiaries if the amount of the discount relates to the avoided collection costs. It's offered to all patients for all services without regard to the patient's reason for admission, length of stay, or DRG. It's not advertised so as to solicit business, so you're not using it as a marketing ploy. You notify private payers of the program so they're aware and they can complain if they don't like you doing it. And the costs are not passed on to Medicare, Medicaid, or other payers. But what about private pay business? Can you offer prompt pay discounts to your private pay patients? Well, there's a few problems with that. It may affect your usual and customary charges. If you're giving a prompt pay to the, uh, of the copay or uh, deductibles, your uh, private pay contract may prevent you from doing that. So they may not like that. You need to check your insurance contracts. You need to check your state laws. Free tests or screening? Well, if you're dealing with government program beneficiaries, the OIG has approved free screening services or tests where that free screening is not conditioned on the use of any items or services from any particular provider, the patient's not directed to any particular provider, the patient is not offered any special discounts or follow-up on follow-up services. If the test shows their abnormal test results, that visitor is advised to see his, his or her own healthcare professional. The key there is you're not using this to steer these patients to you, that you are providing this as a service, it's not tied to getting additional services from you, and that patient is directed to go to their regular health care provider. What about private pay patients? Well, you ought to check state laws to see whether or not that's going to violate any anti-kickback provision that may apply in your state. Free transportation programs? Again, that's a freebie. You may come up and decide, hey, let's go around, round up all these patients, bring them to the hospital. We'll do that as our marketing employee. The problem is that you're offering uh, something for free, something discounted. The government has concerns, but they have approved free transportation, transportation programs where you could go back to that original exception that says, hey, as long as it's not worth more than $10 per visit or more than $50 per year, or they've specifically approved free transportation programs where, among other things, the program is open to all eligible patients. They're not selectively limited to targeted beneficiary populations, so you don't just send it out to pick up your um, high-paying patients or high-program patients. Uh, it's uh, the type of transportation is reasonable. The travel is local to the physician's offices. 
The public transportation and parking is otherwise limited, so there really is a justification for this program. And the cost of the program would not be claimed on the cost report or otherwise shifted to the federal program. That's if you're dealing with federal program beneficiaries. If you're dealing with private payers, well, you gotta check your own state laws to see whether or not there's a violation. Well, those were, that's a discussion of freebies that are provided to patients. What about freebies provided to other providers or other referral sources? Well, if the referral source is for government program business, then for example, a physician, if it's a physician, you gotta be worried about Stark. Stark applies if your marketing program or the freebies you are providing involve a physician or a family member unless that freebie is structured to fit within a Stark safe harbor. In addition, the anti-kickback statute and civil monetary penalties law may apply if one purpose of offering that freebie is to induce referrals, again, unless you structure it to fit within the safe harbor. Note that these laws apply to both the giver and the receiver. So if a vendor comes to you and wants to give you freebies in order to get your business, then the civil monetary penalties law and the anti-kickback statute are going to apply to you also. Now, note that they not only apply to actually giving and receiving, but also even soliciting or offering the freebie. That in and of itself is a violation. So you don't want to go anywhere near that stuff. Well, what about if the referral source is for private pay business? Well, in that case, you generally don't have to worry about the federal fraud and abuse laws. You may have to be concerned about your state laws, so you need to check your state laws on that particular issue. In addition, again, be careful about simply carving out federal program business, because if the participants in this program also refer federal program business to you, even though they don't get the freebie for that, the government may say, hey, we know that by offering that, you're really intending to induce the program business, the federal program business, as well as the private pay business, and therefore, we think that it violates the anti-kickback statute, so be careful of those carve-outs. Well, what about if you want to subsidize the other provider's marketing expenses? So maybe you have a situation, you're a hospital, you have a new physician in your community, you want to go ahead and subsidize their marketing expenses because, hey, you want to maintain a good relationship for that physician. Well, you have to ask yourself, are you marketing their practice or yours? If you're marketing your own practice, okay, well, you're probably fine. But to the extent you're marketing their practice, you are giving them a benefit that um, could induce them to make referrals to you. And so you've got to be concerned about Stark and the anti-kickback statute. Stark applies if and to the extent you're marketing a non-employed physician's practice. Possible safe harbors might include non-monetary compensation of less than $300 a year if the value of that marketing subsidy you're providing is less than $300 per year and you're otherwise satisfying the requirements for that safe harbor. If you're doing this as part of a recruitment agreement, then you may be able to do it under the recruitment safe harbor, but you'd have to make sure that you are satisfying those criteria. On the other hand, you still have to be worried about the anti-kickback statute and the civil monetary penalties law, which are going to apply if one purpose of doing this deal is to induce referrals from the subsidized practitioners. Well, what about if that practitioner is never going to refer federal program business to you, but it's only for private pay business? Again, it may implicate the anti-kickback statute or civil monetary penalties law if the intent was to induce federal program business. It may also violate your state laws, state anti-kickback statutes or the like, so you have to check your state laws. Well, what about if you're not going to subsidize that other physician's practice or marketing practices, but you just want to list that practitioner on your your website, you're a hospital and you want to include that practitioner on your website. Well, according to CMS, that is a benefit to that physician and therefore it's going to trigger Stark. There is an exception under Stark for incidental benefits of medical staff members, which would include listing that physician on your website so long as you do not go beyond simply identifying them as a medical staff member and you don't go further than that to actually advertising their private practice. CMS has said that advertising or promoting a physician's private practice on a hospital website 
is not an accepted incidental benefit, so you'd have to look for another exception under the anti-kickback statute, which you may not be able to find. Well, what about if you want to do a joint marketing program? You want to get together with your physicians and say, hey, let's all get together and let's market this new service line at the hospital or something like that. Are you doing this not with employed physicians, but medical staff members, specialists who engage in a certain service at the hospital, let's do a joint marketing campaign. Well, if and to the extent that you are providing benefits to that particular physician, that's going to create a financial relationship that's going to trigger Stark. That means that you would need to make sure that the payments by the physician, if they're going to pay part of their share, that their payments represent fair market value for the benefits that they're receiving. Unless you can fit within one of the other exceptions, like the non-monetary compensation of less than $300 a year, or the recruitment safe harbor. In addition, because you are helping to market and the physician's presumably going to get a collateral benefit, it could implicate the anti-kickback statute or civil monetary penalties law if one purpose is to induce referrals from those other practitioners, referrals for items or services payable by government health care programs. Well, what about if no government health care programs are implicated and that other physician is never ever going to make any referrals to you for federal program business? Well, you may not have to worry about Stark or the anti-kickback statute, but you still better check your state laws. When you're talking about these joint marketing programs with other providers, it's really a continuum. You've got to ask yourself, are you essentially marketing that physician's private practice? Or if you're a hospital, are you marketing your own practice? To the extent you're marketing your own practice, well, you can go ahead and do that and not worry too much about it. But to the extent that you're giving collateral benefit or marketing that physician's private practice, you got to be worried about those federal laws. So ask yourself, does this joint marketing campaign you're doing, does it focus on the hospital service or the physician's practice? Does it contain the physician's private contact information? So you're not just marketing the service that the hospital's provided, you're really marketing that physician's private practice? Does it contain information about the physician's private practice? Does it promote the physician's services separate and apart from the hospital? If it does, then you've got to be concerned about structuring your deal to fit within the regulations. If you're going to deal with these joint marketing programs with other providers or referral sources, the bottom line here is make sure each party pays their fair share based on, for example, their relative advertising time uh, the benefits that party, the relative advertising space that benefits that other party, the relative focus of the advertisement, you can portion, apportion out the cost according to their relevant benefit. Also, make sure that the arrangement is documented appropriately. If the hospital is going to go ahead and front the cost and that practitioner is going to reimburse the hospital, make sure there's a contract that confirms that the, the physician is reimbursing the hospital for that. The better thing is probably just simply to have the different parties contract separately with the marketing company so that there is no um, financial relationship, at least directly, with the hospital or the entity that's, um, that may create the prohibited relationship. All right, what about paying for leads? We now know that you can't go out and generally pay for referrals. What about if you are working with a website company out there and that website company comes to you and says, hey, We've developed a whole bunch of leads, and we will sell these leads to you for X dollars. When does a lead become a referral so that you cannot purchase it without violating the anti-kickback statute? Well, the government has given us limited guidance on this. The OIG issued an advisory opinion back in 2008, whereby they approved an arrangement in which a website generated these leads and then sold them to chiropractors in their area, and they approved it because of the following factors. The arrangement did not target government beneficiaries as opposed to private pay beneficiaries. If they target government beneficiaries, there's more of a risk. The arrangement did not actively steer patients to a particular provider. In fact, instead, the provider just purchased these leads and had to go out there and make the contacts. The fees paid did not depend on whether the lead became a patient. Instead, they were kind of a general purchase for these potential leads, but they weren't otherwise qualified. 
There was no health information that was collected by the lead generator, the website company. For example, they didn't ask information about the, the potential lead's age, illness, products current, that they're currently used, the insurance coverage, et cetera. And essentially, the lead generator did not qualify the lead, meaning that lead generator was not acting on behalf of the, um, the provider to identify or qualify these people who would be referrals. If they had, then it becomes closer to a referral, and so paying that person to do those services especially when it's conditioned on the, the referrals, then it may actually turn to paying for uh, referrals rather than paying for a lead. In addition, to the extent that that lead generator is acting on your behalf and going out there and actually finding those names, then that may actually make them a business associate. It would trigger HIPAA, so now HIPAA is going to apply to all of that information that that lead generator comes up with if they are doing it on your own behalf. Now, if they came up with those names on their own, and then they go sell them to you after the fact, but they weren't contracted with you to provide those names for you on your behalf, then you probably don't have those HIPAA concerns. But once they become your agent, once they become their business associate, then HIPAA is going to apply to all of that information. It'll become protected health information. Well, that brings us to the issue about well, what about if you do want to go out and contract with these separate entities or an outside marketing company? Can you pay them to generate referrals for you? Well, yeah, but you want to structure the deal in order to fit within an anti-kickback safe harbor. Essentially, in order to do that, if they're not your employee, if they're an independent contractor, you need to make sure that the compensation is set in advance and it's not based on the volume of valid referrals. So you could pay them by hour, you could pay them by job, so long as the compensation you're paying them is not based on the volume or value of referrals. Some people had asked the OIG to extend safe harbor protection to these independent contractor or commission-based contractor arrangements, and the government refused. They said that we are aware of many examples of abusive practices by sales personnel who are paid as independent contractors. We believe that if individuals and entities desire to pay a salesperson on the basis of the amount of business they generated, then, to be exempt from civil or criminal prosecution, they should make these salespersons employees where they can and should exert appropriate supervision for the individual's acts. Again, they don't want to see you paying these independent contractors in uh, a fee that varies with the volume of valid referrals, so it creates this incentive for them to make referrals to you. That's if you're dealing with government program beneficiaries or pro government program business. If you're dealing with purely private pay business, you need to check your state law to see whether or not it would be prohibited. White coat marketing. White coat marketing are those situations where you as a healthcare provider, you have developed a certain level of trust and you have, uh, the, the patient has trust in you, you've got uh, influence over that particular patient, the patient expects you to act in their best interest, and therefore the government's concerned if you're out there abusing that trust. Therefore, if you, the government's going to come in there, if they're ever going to come in there and look at your marketing practices to see if you're violating the anti-kickback statute or the civil monetary penalties law, they're going to have a concern if you are doing that advertising through a trusted healthcare provider and that provider recommends a particular product or service because there's this kind of undue influence. There's no general prohibition against this. It's just one of those factors that the government really doesn't like if they're going to look at your program. You don't want to be involved in the white coat uh, marketing if your program is otherwise suspect. Now, the government has said that there's a lower risk of concern if the advertising is accurate, it's not deceptive, it's passive, meaning you're not directly there in front of the patient in their face or applying um, strong arm tactics. And if it's provided in general broadcast media, not targeted to that particular patient. In those situations, you don't have the same concerns. Well, what about if it's not government program beneficiaries that you're marketing? What about private pay business? Well, you don't probably have the same concerns with the federal government at least with the OIG, but you got to be concerned about deceptive advertising in those white coat marketing situations, and I'll talk about that in a minute. 
All right, that is a summary of the fraud and abuse laws, just a quick down and dirty guide. Do not advertise or use the following as part of a marketing program, especially if it concerns government program beneficiaries. Don't use waivers or co-pays and deductibles. You don't want to advertise those. Prompt pay discounts, charity care or write-offs due to financial need, free or discounted items if you intend to rely on an exception for services. For all of those things to get the benefit of the government exceptions, they can't be advertised. The government doesn't want to see you using those as a marketing tool. You also need to be aware of offering freebies to patients or other referral sources. Beware of receiving freebies yourself from vendors because even though you're not offering it, if you're receiving it, hey, you can be liable for anti-kickback violations. You can go to jail just as quickly as the vendor in that situation. Beware paying contractors based on the volume of value of their referrals. The bottom line is when you're doing these marketing campaigns, ask yourself, are you giving or receiving freebies in order to induce referrals? If you are, you got to look for a safe harbor or make sure you're okay under these federal fraud abuse laws. All right, next, let's talk about HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. HIPAA generally says you cannot use or disclose protected health information without the patient's written HIPAA-compliant authorization unless an exception applies. Note that that applies to the use or disclosure. You cannot even use the patient's information for your internal marketing purposes unless you fit within an exception. Note that protected health information is very broad. It applies to any individually identifiable health information, including but not limited to the patient's names, addresses, phone numbers, account numbers, URLs, or IP addresses. So if you want to package up the patient's URLs or IP addresses and send those off to your marketing company, hey, that's protected health information. It also applies to photos, images, or videos. If you want to use the patient's photos, images, or videos, you better darn well get a patient authorization. Or any other information that may reasonably be used to identify an individual. What happens if you violate it? All sorts of penalties, including a mandatory fine of at least $10,000 if you are deemed to have acted with willful neglect. You can also go to jail for HIPAA penalties. Now, there are exceptions that would allow you to use or disclose the information without a patient's authorization, the most important of which is you may use or disclose protected health information without the patient's authorization for purposes of treatment or healthcare operations. So if you want to contact the patient to talk about treatment alternatives, that's okay. You can generally do that. Same thing with healthcare operations, which include contacting patients with information about treatment alternatives and related functions that do not involve treatment. You can do that without the patient's authorization unless you have agreed otherwise with the patient that you won't use or disclose their information for treatment or payment or healthcare operations without their consent. Be careful about your agreements with the patients or your intake forms. You don't want to agree to place these additional restrictions on your use or ability to use the information for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. If you have, then that may prohibit you from engaging in marketing you could otherwise do. Now, disclosures for treatment or healthcare operations have to be distinguished from marketing purposes. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over a couple of those slides, and I'm going to go to the bottom line. For treatment or operations, as long as you're using or disclosing the information for treatment or operations, you do not require the patient's authorization. On the other hand, if you're using it or disclosing it for marketing, you have to have the patient's authorization. Now, what is treatment or operations? Well, it's communicating for purposes of treatment or communicating about your own products or services unless unless you are being paid by a third party to give that communication, okay? If you are, then it converts it into marketing. And for marketing, you generally need the patient's authorization before you can use or disclose their, their in protected health information. In contrast, what's marketing? Marketing is communicating about another's product unless you're making that disclosure for purposes of treating the patient and no, you don't receive any remuneration. If you're making it for treatment purposes, it's for treatment, not for marketing, unless you're receiving remuneration. 
Uh, marketing is also communicating about your own product or service if the, you're getting remuneration from a third party for giving that communication. So that's basically the bottom line. You can use or disclose the information to tell patients about your own products or services or to tell the patients about another's products or services so long as it's for treatment purposes, so long as you don't get paid for it. But if you're getting paid for that, then it becomes marketing. Or if you are making disclosures about another product, uh, another entity's products or services, generally you need the patient's written authorization. But what about fundraising? If you're an entity like a 501c3 or a hospital that goes out there and relies on fundraising, HIPAA allows you to use or disclose certain information for fundraising purposes. A covered entity may disclose the following information to a business associate or institutionally related foundation for purposes of raising funds for its own benefit without an authorization, without the patient's authorization. Things like name, address, contact info, age, gender, and birth date, dates of health care provided to the individual, the Department of Service information, so where that patient received their care, which department, the treating physician, outcome information, health insurance status, and those are the items that you may use or disclose for fundraising purposes. But you can only use the minimum necessary for those purposes. In addition, in order to use that for fundraising purposes, you have to satisfy certain conditions. You've got to notify the patient in your Notice of Privacy Practices that you're going to use their information for fundraising purposes. Every time you communicate with the patient for fundraising, you've got to provide a clear and conspicuous opportunity that allows them to opt out of those fundraising communications, and that method can't impose an undue burden. You may not condition your treatment or payment on the participation in fundraising. You may not make fundraising communications to individuals who opt out. And, but you may notify individuals if they want to opt back in to get those fundraising communications in the future, to how they can opt back in as if that's ever going to happen. All right, sell of protected health information. You've out there, you've done a great job marketing. You've generated a whole bunch of information about these potential leads. You want to go sell those to some third party because they're worth a lot of money. Bottom line is, if you did that in your capacity as a covered entity or a business associate, that is protected health information. You cannot sell protected health information without the patient's authorization. All right, business associates. HIPAA not only applies to covered entities, but also covered entities, business associates. Business associates are those entities with whom you share protected health information to perform a function on your behalf. So for example, you're a covered entity and you contract with one of those really cool third-party marketing companies to come in there and help you market their patients. And if you're going to share protected health information with that marketing company, you have to have a business associate agreement with that other marketing company. That marketing company is a business associate. They are now going to be subject to HIPAA and going to be subject to penalties if they violate HIPAA. They've got to comply with the terms of HIPAA, even if you don't get a business associate agreement. Um, if they go ahead and then use subcontractors to provide services and share protected health information with those subcontractors, they've got to make sure they've got a business associate agreement with those subcontractors. Okay, we've talked about the privacy rule. What about the security rule? Well, the security rule requires covered entities and their business associates to implement specified safeguards to protect their electronic protected health information, those administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. So that marketing company that you've now contracted with, who is now your business associate, they've also got to comply with all those security rules that you guys have been struggling with for a long time. Now, when you're talking about, among other things, for the technical safeguards, they've got to include a mechanism to encrypt electronic protected health information whenever deemed appropriate. What does that mean? Well, what about if they communicate with patients via email or text. Can they do that without violating the privacy or security rules? We're all moving to social media. We're dealing with emails, texts, more and more all the time. Can you do that? Can you communicate with your patients for purposes of marketing without violating the HIPAA privacy or security rules? Well, the bottom line is when it comes to the security rule, generally, yeah, you can go ahead and communicate with your patients and share protected health information as long as you put in place reasonable safeguards. This commentary, this FAQ on your screen, contains some suggested safeguards. That's the privacy rule. 
But remember, you've also got to comply with the security rule. And the security rule generally says, hey, encryption is an addressable standard. The FAQ dealing with the security rule says that the security rule does not expressly prohibit the use of email for sending electronic protected health information, but that doesn't mean that you can just do it. You've got to make sure that you've got in place the reasonable safeguards that are required by the security rule. That means you've got to assess its use of open networks, identify available and appropriate means to protect electronic protected health information as it is transmitted, select a solution, and document the decision. The security rule allows for EPHI to be sent over an electronic open network as long as it is adequately protected. That generally means encryption. If you're not going to have an encrypted system, then you got to be concerned about potential HIPAA compliance. Now, when the omnibus rule came out, people had asked them, can we send emails to patients via an encrypted email or text? In that commentary, the government said, yeah, generally you can, so long as the patient agrees to accept that email via an encrypted text and you notify the patient, you warn them that that email may not be secure. So if you want to communicate with your patients the safest via email or text, unsecured, unencrypted email or text, the safest thing is to um, ensure that they agree to receive those communications and notify them of the security risks. That's if you're going to be sending any protected health information in that email. Remember, protected health information is very broad. So if you're sending information even though you're not saying, hey, you've got this situation, even if you're not including very specific information about their condition, if you're sending them information generally about, a, about the condition and it's clear that that patient must have the condition, then that could constitute PHI and could trigger the uh, HIPAA rules. If you're not disclosing protected health information in the email, then you're probably okay as long as you apply reasonable safeguards, but be careful even in that situation because remember, the patient's URL or IP address are protected health information in and of themselves. So theoretically, I suppose the OCR could come in there and say, hey, if you're communicating even by sending this marketing stuff to these patients because you're using their URL or their IP address, that's protected health information, they could say maybe that's a violation. I think that that's unlikely as long as you're really careful and you do not disclose um, any significant or meaningful protected health information in the email communications. All right, while we're talking about communicating by email or text, remember that in addition to HIPAA, that there are other laws that may affect your ability to communicate or advertise or market via email or text, including the CAN Spam Act or the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Let's talk about that Telephone Communication Protection Act and telemarketing. The TCPA generally prohibits using pre-recorded calls to a residence or pre-recorded or auto-dialed calls to a wireless number without the recipient's prior express consent. This TCPA has been around for a while, but last year they modified it to uh, change some of the requirements. Among other things, they added an exemption or clarified an exemption so that the TCPA requirements, the prohibitions against using these robocalls or pre-recorded calls, do not apply to healthcare-related calls to a residential and likely wireless numbers. The government said that, hey, because those healthcare calls are otherwise protected by HIPAA, we don't need the protection under the, the TCPA. So that's what would allow you to have that auto call that would be able to go to the a patient's home to tell them about reporting reminders or the like. <clears throat> uh, there are other laws dealing with telemarketing, such as the Telemarketing Consumer Fraud and Abuse Prevention Act and the FCC telemarketing sales rules that are associated with that. They basically prohibit deceptive and abusive telemarketing practices. Um, part of the reason for modifying the TCPA was to make it align with these other telemarketing rules. There are other rules against telemarketing that apply to DME POSs. I'll talk about those in a minute. When you're talking about telemarketing, if you want to engage in telemarketing with your patients, it's possible that even though those federal rules do not apply because, for example, they apply primarily to pre-recorded or robocalls, you still may have to be concerned about additional state laws. 
All right, let's talk about false or deceptive advertising. You guys would never knowingly engage in false or deceptive advertising, but your Medical Practices Act generally place a very high standard, a higher standard on professionals when they're doing advertising. Most states' Medical Practices Act prohibit items such as the following, misrepresenting or omitting material facts in your advertising, creating unjustified expectations of favorable results, including the use of photos, models, or guaranteed results. So if you're using photos that really aren't accurate or create unjustified expectations, or if you're guaranteeing results, even though we know we can never guarantee results in medicine, then that could be a violation of the Medical Practices Act. Promoting items that are not necessary or medically indicated, representing that an incurable condition may be cured, abusing or explo exploiting the trust of a patient, making a false or misleading statement concerning the person's skill or efficacy of the treatment, representing that you have superior skill if it's really not supported by reliable data, if ever challenged, similarly making a scientific claim that cannot be supported by reliable data, representing yourself as a specialist or certified if you really aren't, uh, specialist or certified as defined by state law, advertising in any other unethical or unprofessional manner, or misrepresenting fees or charges. Now, you'd have to go back and look at your particular state law, but those types of provisions are pretty common. That's what you are probably going to see. In addition to the state law, the uh, AMA has published an ethics rule dealing with uh, unprofessional advertising. We'll talk about that in a minute. What happens if you violate those State Print Medical Practices Act? Well, that could result in adverse licensure action that may result in civil fines or penalties. It could result in an injunction or other equitable relief. It could re, uh, re, uh, result in adverse credentialing actions against you. It could result in adverse publicity and professional embarrassment. The bottom line is you don't want to go there. It, a violation of the Medical Practice Act could also give rise to an action by the patients. Maybe they claim that you, uh, it resulted in a malpractice claim or caused malpractice. It resulted in a breach of contract claim because you made promises that you couldn't fulfill. It could result in fraud. The bottom line is you want to make sure that you're fair and accurate in your advertising. In addition to the Medical Practices Act, there are the general truth in advertising laws that would apply to you also, including the Federal Trade Commission Act that prohibits false and deceptive or misleading advertising. Most states have their own consumer protection laws that do things such as prohibit representing that goods or services have approval characteristics, uses, or benefits or qualities they do not have, representing that a person has approval status or affiliation that he or she does not have, representing that goods or services are of a particular standard quality uh, or quality if they are of another, or engage in any other unconscionable, false, misleading, or deceptive act or practice. So you not only have to be concerned about the state licensing board coming after you, you could be concerned about the state AG coming after you for criminal fines or penalties, civil fines or penalties, injunction or other equitable relief, or any other parade of horribles. Also, when you're considering these truth in advertising laws, remember that if you're advertising in one state, your advertising may actually cross state boundaries and go into another state. So if that's the case, then you not only have to be concerned about the state in which you practice, but maybe those other states where you are reaching out to bring in patients. So you may need to be concerned about those other states. Uh, a word about uh, testimonials and endorsements. Uh, some states actually prohibit physicians and providers from using testimonials as endorsements. That's probably uncommon, but some states do. In addition, the FTC has issued a whole bunch of guidelines that if you want to use testimonials or endorsements, including endorsements from healthcare providers or testimonials from patients, you are supposed to comply with these guidelines that you can access at 16 CFR Part 255. The AMA has issued its ethics guidance concerning truth in advertising, including testimonials. Among other things, it states that testimonials of patients as to the physician's skills or the quality of the physician's professional services tend to be deceptive when they do not reflect the results that patients with conditions comparable to the testimonials condition generally receive. 
objective claims regarding experience, competence, and the quality of physicians and services and the services they provide may be made only if they are factually supportable. Similarly, generalized statements of satisfaction with a physician's services may be made if they are representative of the experience of that of the physician's patients. The bottom line is be careful in testimonials. Now, of course, the AMA, you can't go to jail or you can't get hit up with fines for the AMA if you violate those ethics standards, but it's a good rule of thumb for evaluating testimonials or endorsements. All right, in the closing minutes, a couple of specific limitations that apply to certain providers or, in this case, plans. Um, certain plans have to comply with a whole series of Medicare marketing guidelines. These are your Medicare Advantage plans, your prescription drug plans, or your Section 1876 cost plans. The government has issued very long, very detailed medical marketing guidelines. The government was concerned about these plans going out and acting in a deceptive or improper manner or unduly influencing Medicare beneficiaries. And so if you're going to contract with the government to uh, issue these plans, then you've got to satisfy these very long, very complex marketing guidelines. Now, those marketing guidelines not only apply to the plans, but they also apply to providers who contract with the plans. For example, plan providers cannot accept enrollment applications from the plan, steer beneficiaries to the plan based on financial interest, mail marketing materials for the plan, offer inducements to beneficiaries, including pre-screenings. So even though it may be allowed under the civil monetary penalties law, if you satisfy those other criteria, if you are a provider who has contracted with the plan, then you can't offer free screenings in order to market uh, that plan. There are a bunch of other requirements. The bottom line is, if you're in bed with uh, one of these Medicare plans, if you're a contracted provider under one of these Medicare plans, you may need to check that plan's website or their guidance concerning what you can and cannot do regarding marketing Medicare beneficiaries. Also, suppliers of durable medical equipment, prosthetics, orthotics, and supplies, or DME POSs, may not directly market Medicare beneficiaries through the telephone. So you can't directly pick up the phone, call the patient, call the Medicare beneficiary, unless that beneficiary gave written permission for that contact in advance. That contact is for a covered item that the supplier has already furnished, or the supplier has furnished at least one covered item to, benefit to that beneficiary during the prior 15 months. Again, the government was concerned about abusive tactics where DME, POSs were out there contacting Medicare beneficiaries. In order to protect them, the government places these limitations on the DME, POSs' ability to contact the patients by telephone unless they can satisfy these criteria. The penalties are, if you do make that improper contact by phone, the government won't pay for any items that were ordered or provided per that improper solicitation. In addition, if you've got a pattern of doing that stuff, you may be excluded from Medicare and Medicaid. Well, that is a brief overview of some of the laws that apply to providers. If you are another type of healthcare entity out there, like medical device manufacturers or pharmaceutical manufacturers, there are other laws that may apply. There are other government agencies that may have their own specific guidance requirements like the FDA for drugs, FTC, the FCC, USDA, CMS, state agencies, or licensing boards. Just make sure that you're aware of those rules that apply to your specific situation. All right, in the two minutes I have left, here is my quick summary of what you need to do to make sure that you stay on the right side of these Medicare marketing guidelines. First, I think that you need to go back and review your existing arrangements, particularly your marketing programs to patients. Beware any inducements or freebies that you're giving to patients, especially government beneficiaries. If you've got deals where you are giving away free diapers or free this or that or other to, bene to beneficiaries, you got to be concerned about that. Also, do not advertise where you throw co-pays, indigency discounts, or those types of things. You also need to look at your arrangements with vendors and referral sources, including other providers. Beware free or discounted items or services that's giving them or receiving them. Ensure your financial arrangements with physicians and other referral sources to the extent you've got a contract fit within an applicable safe harbor. 
Generally, you need to have a written agreement for those services, and you've got to make sure the compensation is sent in advance and not based on the volume or value of referrals. So beware of paying commissioners or paying commissions to anybody who's engaging in marketing on your behalf. You need to take a look at your compliance plan. Make sure that it addresses these marketing issues and train your marketing department on these compliance issues because unless they've or savvy have been around the industry, they really don't understand these requirements. You want to make sure that they are aware of these problems. Otherwise, they can create issues for you. Then you're going to want to document that training. When your people get involved in new marketing programs, you want to make sure that somebody who knows this stuff looks at their marketing programs for compliance, including maybe your compliance officer or other person who understands the rules. If there is a violation, require immediate reports so that you can take appropriate action. Protect the patient information through all of this process. You need to execute business associate agreements with marketing contractors if you're going to share your patient information with them. And remember, patient information is defined very broadly. Do not use patient photos, quotes, or other identifying information without a valid HIPAA authorization. And you also ought to get a media release to protect yourself. Do not talk about specific patients at all, even if you try to remove the identifying information. Remember, PHI is defined very broadly, and sometimes you want to tell about a particular patient experience, but you are concerned about HIPAA, you don't have an authorization, so you're going to talk in generalities. That's really hard to do, because chances are you're going to say something, and somebody out there listening is going to say, well, they're talking about Bob. The better rule is simply don't talk about specific patients at all, even if you try to remove the identifying information. Beware remuneration from third parties in exchange for marketing the products or services that may convert you, um, what you are doing from treatment or operations over into marketing. Marketing generally requires you to have the patient's authorization to use or disclose their information for marketing purposes. You need to implement appropriate safeguards for email or other communications via the internet or elsewhere, and monitor social media. Social media, of course, is a, is a growing area of advertising. You need to monitor that to make sure that nobody's messing up. When you do get involved in your advertising, ensure your statements are accurate and supportable. Do not overpromise or guarantee results. Include appropriate disclaimers such as results may vary. Beware using photos, endorsements, and or testimonials because they may create false impressions and subject you to liability under your Medical Practices Act or elsewhere. Avoid high pressure direct contact white coat marketing situations. Be very careful in making comparisons with competitors unless you can absolutely support it. And don't claim expertise that you don't have or overstate your credentials. That is it. That is a brief overview of marketing traps for healthcare professionals. If you want additional resources, the government has some stuff on its compliance website, including advisory bulletins, special fraud alerts, and the like. If you have questions, feel free to use that chat function. You can send them to me or shoot me a quick email, and I will respond to you offline. Otherwise, once again, thank you for participating today. I hope this has been helpful, and good luck out there as you engage in marketing.